you. Uh, but um, my name is Tiana Lindberg. I'm the clinical director of occupational therapy at Sasko River Center. Um, this is Dr. Lisa Doby. Um, she's one of our psychologists and we'll introduce herself in a second. Um, we're presenting today on the topic of co-regulation um, and co-regulation to foster connections with our kids. Lisa, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm Lisa Doby. I am a licensed psychologist um, at Sasko River Center. Um, I'm also a Connecticut State and nationally certified school psychologist, and I have spent a lot of time working in schools, um, in particular working specifically with kids who um, have a lot of behavior challenges and sort of by definition have a hard time with regulation. So this this talk and this topic is near and dear to my heart. And as an occupational therapist, um, I work to help kids be regulated and um, support their self-regulation growth uh, through uh, sensory regulation strategies. Um, so I have been working in this field um, for at least eight years now. Um, and interestingly, when I started my career, I was like, oh, I, I don't know how much I uh, believe this sensory regulation uh, aspect. And then I got into the neuroscience behind it um, and fell in love. So you might hear me be a little nerdy about some of the science, but that's kind of what helps us know that it's working the way we expect it to and want it to. Um, okay. So our agenda today, um, is what is co-regulation. Um, a lot of people know what regulation means but or self-regulation, but what's co-regulation? Um, why is it important? Uh, and talking about co-regulation strategies, both during hot times um, and proactive co-regulation strategies. Then we'll finish up with a little bit of Q&A. Um, you can always contact us should you need anything or uh, have further questions from this. Um, you feel free to post questions uh, in the chat, there'll be one or two times that we ask the group questions. So just kind of get a pulse of um, who you are so we can cater our uh, stories to the audience, et cetera. All right, so as we were sort of preparing for this talk um, and thinking about like what is co-regulation and how could we sort of demonstrate an example of co-regulation, um, I was thinking, about this student that I used to work with many, many years ago. Um, and this, I don't wanna call it an incident, but um, something that happened that sort of, I think really sort of ties together a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about today. So um, I worked with this kid, he was an elementary aged kiddo many years ago um, who had a very difficult time with regulating himself. Um, so he was a kid who would often, um, when something didn't go the way that he wanted it to, or something was unexpected for him, he would he would yell, he would swear, he would sometimes kick things or people. Um, so he showed a lot of dysregulation on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I remember one one day I was sitting in my office, sort of typing away, and um, he and an adult, I think it was a paraprofessional, came in. Um, he was very very upset super, super dysregulated, doing all the things that I just sort of mentioned. He was yelling, he was crying. Um, and the adult that was with him had also, I think, become dysregulated because he was dysregulated, right? So it turned into this sort of cycle or circle of dysregulation that everybody was sharing. Um, and in the end, what what worked and what ultimately calmed him down was for me to get down sort of on his level. So literally crouch down with him. Um, and we just breathed together. Um, and I, I, I feel like it's an example of me sort of as a regulated adult in that situation, sort of sharing my regulation with him. Um, and so he was really concerned at that point about like, am I going to be in trouble or there like, because I know, oh, I think he had hit someone. Like, I know that I did something that I wasn't supposed to. And he sort of kept perseverating on this idea. Um, and so I just remember saying to him, like, I'm going to hold on to that for you, that worry that you have. All that I need for you to do right now is to breathe with me. And I focused on my own breathing and eventually his breathing calmed down too. And we were sort of able to bring the situation down. So I share that for a couple of different reasons. One, again, I think it it demonstrates 
some of what we're going to be talking about, that kind of in the moment co-regulation, where as an adult, um, you are really sort of sharing your regulatory capacity with um, a child or sometimes even another adult. Um, and also, and I think we've all gotten trapped in this cycle of being an adult who's with a dysregulated child who then dysregulates us and we're not able to bring that kid kind of back to baseline. Um, so we're going to be talking kind of throughout this this talk and this presentation about um, some of the things that you can do to co-regulate in the moment, some of the things that you can do if you are not if you are not self-regulated enough um, to co-regulate with a child. And then we're also going to talk about some proactive um, things that, that you can do that aren't in the moment. So for this particular child, we worked a lot on coping strategies. So figuring out what were his sort of trigger points and strategies that he could use in, in those moments. We worked on sort of rearranging the environment, um, meaning like, could we be clearer with our expectations? Could we be clearer with how we're going to respond um, to create an environment that felt really safe for him? And, you know, he's kind of an extreme example, but I think those strategies um, are things that we can do for, for all kids and, and in, in some ways for all age brackets as well. All right, so we are going to be talking at length about co-regulation, and we have started to talk about co-regulation, but before we get there, we really need to talk about self-regulation, um, because ultimately, when we're working or we're, we're interacting with a, a child to help them to co-regulate with them, the ultimate goal is really for them to be able to self-regulate. So what is self-regulation? Um, it is defined as the act of managing thoughts and feelings to enable goal-directed actions and includes a variety of behaviors is necessary for success in school, relationships, and the workplace. So basically, it's the ability to sort of hold yourself together to do the things that you need to do, right? Um, and this definition is not mine. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about was taken from actually a practice brief um, by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation that you're going to find in our uh, reference list. Um, and you can move on to the next slide, Deanna. And so self-regulation develops through the interaction with caregivers, such as parents, teachers, coaches, and other mentors. And its development is dependent on predictable, responsive, and supportive environments. So why we're talking about self-regulation as part of a co-regulation talk is because it's really important when we're working with, or we have kids, we're, we're interacting with kids, um, that we are making sure that caregivers kind of know how to provide that support and know what these things are, right? So that's hopefully why you guys are all here. All right, so then co-regulation is the supportive process between a caregiver and a child that fosters regulation, and it looks very different at different ages. Um, so we are, when we get later on in our, our talk, when we are going through some of the more proactive strategies that you can use, um, it's sort of by age and stage, um, because co-regulation looks very different for a toddler than it would for a teenager. Um, though it's important to have those uh, skills and to, to be able to co-regulate with all of those age brackets. All right, so co-regulation can be thought of as being divided into like three sort of different buckets. Um, so providing a warm and responsive relationship, um, structuring the environment, and then teaching and coaching self-regulation skills. So what does that mean? Um, so providing a warm, responsive relationship is really um, that opportunity to provide unconditional positive regard. So that just when with your, with your child, um, having them know that no matter what, you care about them and you care for them. Um, that's also that this bucket sort of covers that in the moment support. So when you're recognizing, responding to cues that your child is upset, um, that they're being triggered by something, that something is going on, and then providing that care and support in those times of stress, um, kind of all, again, falls under the bucket of warm, responsive relationship. Structuring the environment, what the heck does that mean? Um, so I sort of alluded to this when I was talking about my, my little dysregulated friend. Um, this is really providing a physically and emotionally safe environment. So we do that in all sorts of different ways, but one of the ways that that adults really do that or parents really do that for kids is providing consistent and predictable routines, expectations that are really clear, and then logical consequences. So if this happens, this is how we're going to respond. 
And I think that we don't always think of that as part of co-regulation, right? But really by providing that, those types of supports, again, not in those moments of stress, um, it provides security and safety for kids um, in ways that I think we don't even necessarily recognize, right? Um, but but having boundaries, having expectations, having like really clear um boundaries, expectations, et cetera, uh, is actually very comforting and, and, and soothing, um, and is a way to sort of keep regulated. The last bucket is teaching and coaching self-regulation skills. Um, and so those are things like modeling, providing opportunities to practice, reinforcing kids for, um, when they're using some of those strategies. And I think of that as like, um, and again, this is going to change based on the age of uh, your child. Um, but when you are feeling frustrated, um, sometimes even saying out loud, like I am, I'm feeling really frustrated right now. So I'm going to take some deep breaths because I know that's going to calm me down. That's modeling those, those skills. Um, for some kids, that's enough for other kids you want to be a little bit more explicit in terms of how you're teaching you know so in this situation it could be really helpful to use this strategy um and again those can be sort of not in the moment not when in those times of stress though you can certainly provide reminders in times of stress um but these are sort of day-to-day -day things that you can you can model you, you can coach you can you can provide is those those coping tools or those self-regulation skills so, so those are our three buckets of co-regulation Sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, and so tying it back to caregiver or parent self-regulation um, in stressful times or in the moment when you are co-regulating with your child um, or again, with anybody or with a spouse, um, making sure that you're aware of your feelings and your reactions. So because otherwise we, we we fall victim to that sort of deregulation loop, right? That I was talking about with, um, with the story that I shared and the other adult who was just also dysregulated um, and unable to co-regulate in the moment, which happens to all of us. Um, but really understanding, are there triggers for you? So I think about like for parents of teenagers or parents of adolescents, if you have just gotten a door slammed in your face um, or someone, your child has chosen some choice words to sort of send in your direction and understanding that that's a trigger for you and that's going to make you have some really big feelings, just being aware of those feelings and and knowing what your triggers are um, will, be, will make you better able to co-regulate in those really stressful moments. On the flip side of that, maybe you have a younger kid, maybe you have a toddler and you are trying to get out the door in the morning and they're demanding a banana and you don't have a banana to give them and they have just thrown themselves on the ground and they are not budging and you have a big work meeting and you're, you can't leave the house. Like you're sort of trapped. Um, understanding again, what are your feelings in that situation and how can you manage them? Um, attending to the thoughts and beliefs about the behaviors of others. Um, we often have a tendency to make assumptions about where someone else is coming from. Sometimes they're accurate, sometimes they're correct, sometimes they're not. So um, I think, you know, going back to the example of if you have a teenager who is upset about something and they're they're calling you some not so kind, they have some not kind words to share with you or at you, it can feel very much like that's targeted at you, but the actual reason they're upset probably has nothing to do with you. Like maybe they had, maybe they failed a math test. Maybe they got into a fight with a friend. Maybe it was just a bad day. Um, that's also true by the way of other adults. We often make assumptions about what, where someone else is coming from if they are dysregulated, right? So just thinking about, okay, so this, this dysregulation, this behavior might not have anything to do with me, or maybe I can think about where it might be coming from to better support um, my kid. Um, and then finally, using strategies to, to, to calm yourself down and knowing what works for you in that moment, if you are, you know, you've been triggered, things are really stressful, and you want to help out your child, um, what strategies work for you. Um, and I share, I think most of the kids that I work with know that I hate getting stuck at red lights. Um, it 
frustrates me more than it should. It's irrational. I'm aware of that. Um, but for whatever reason, it drives me nuts. So I know that my strategies in that situation are to count. I'm not kidding. This is what I do. Um, or to count down from 10. And if I'm not calm by the time I count down from 10 to try it again. Um, and then to remind myself that like the red light's not going to last forever. I've never gotten stuck at a red light for like hours and hours at a time. Eventually this is going to get better, right? Like those are my strategies that I use. Um, it's not necessarily strategies that are going to work for everybody, but again, just kind of knowing what works for you in those moments um, so that you will be better able to support your child. All right. And then finally, so why is co-regulation important? Um, we sort of already touched on the idea that by modeling coping strategies and using some of our proactive strategies, um, we're really teaching our kids self-regulation strategies, right? Um, but it turns out that co-regulating um, and providing the, some of these supports actually helps with the relationship that you have with your kids. It all it actually helps with attachment. Um, and ultimately, faster resolutions to whatever the problem is, right? So if you are able to co-regulate in those times of like explosive stress, um, you are better able to bring it down to baseline faster, which I think is just better for everybody. Okay, so um, now we get to talk on the why does this work? Um, because we, and anyone can come up with uh, strategies or theories, but going down back to the science of why this works and this model of co-regulation might be a little bit of a different model than you might have grown up with um, and how your parents responded to you in certain areas. Um, and those, our family history sometimes stays with us. So knowing why this works and why the science is um, supportive of it is important. Um, so I'm going to give you a, little, a quick crash course in some neuroscience. Uh, we have these things called mirror neurons. Um, they are in our brain uh, and they really have been more heavily researched within the last 10 years. We knew about them, but more heavily then. Um, and they're nerves or neurons that uh, get stimulated when they we see the faces and the affects of others so what allows us or if you've ever you know gone to um a movie and seen someone crying and you kind of start to feel that that urge to cry or um you see someone get excited and your heart starts to to race it's because the body's seeing somebody else's emotion and is emulating them it allows for attachments to occur um but it also has some um, safety measures as well. So if we see someone that looks really scared or upset, uh, you know, if we were if we're thinking about evolution, um, it puts us on edge that there might be something dangerous around. So we're kind of primed to react. Um, you might see uh, little kids when you know, they try a new activity; they'll kind of be looking back to mom or dad for reassurance and. The parent having a calm face often calms them down without even having to say anything. It's that co-regulation of just kind of that facial awareness. Um, this is important because uh, when a child or you get upset, now the opposite person. So if, if um, my the child I'm working with is getting upset, my brain is wired to become more elevated. Um, so it is natural for me to feel... Um, more heightened, more edgy, and more emotional. So I'm primed now to react more to what they're uh, saying, how they're acting, because they're distressed. That said, if uh, I choose to react in a, a way that is in a heightened um, state, maybe yell back or try to over-rationalize um, or get frustrated, now they're taking those uh, cues and they're getting more elevated. So then you see this, it, it's kind of a, that's where that power struggle comes in. One, then the other, then the other, um, kind of upping the ante. Um, the difference uh, is as adults, hopefully our executive functioning, so that's that our front part of the brain that makes all the decisions, uh, has had a little bit of time to mature. So uh, you can kind of think to yourself, okay, this is getting out of hand. What am I doing here? And taking those steps when we talked we talked about self regulation, we'll go over how to regulate your uh, some common tips in those moments. So that way you're emulating 
calm. And if you're emulating calm, then they're starting to take in those visual cues of being calm. Is it a quick fix? No, but it helps kind of us understand why things can get out of control really quickly. Uh, I've had it myself um, within my family, both with adult relationships and child relationships. It's a normal reaction. And I think understanding the biology kind of shows us this is normal. Um, it just understanding it gives us the upper hand of how to manage it in the moment. So uh, fight or flight versus rest and digest. A little bit more about the brain. The front part of our brain is our thinking part of our brain. This is the most developed part of our brain. Um, versus the back part of our brain, we sometimes call it the lizard brain, uh, is the emotional part of our brain. When we are really upset, um, the emotional part of our brain is taking control. It actually, the pathways to the front part of the brain start to turn off. It, it becomes in that fight or flight or emergency response pattern. And we're really only thinking from that um, emotional part of our brain. So that, again, evolutionarily wise, um, allowed us to be able to run really fast if we were perceiving a threat um, and get away from something. If we were really hungry, we would kind of be primed to react quickly um, to maybe the gazelle in the distance, and that would give us the advantage to kind of satiate that hunger. We still have those reactions. It just we don't have the same level of um, danger. Uh, so, but we are still kind of sometimes our bodies have shifted to instead of just running to having these emotional reactions to being in that fight or flight state um the fight or flight state is uh, a state of um it's the sympathetic system that is acting um but we have the opposite uh part of our nervous system the parasympathetic which helps us go into more of that rest and digest um so then when my next step is to talk about strategies that really help the body go into rest and digest using um, some of the things we know about uh, the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so when we talk about regulation, we talk uh, a couple phrases that we use are go low and slow. Um, if, as I mentioned, when you're upset, it becomes very difficult to think rationally, both for ourselves and for our, our kids. Um, so holding on to these little sayings can be helpful uh, to remember yourself. What is, what? Am, what's my goal here? So low um, is, as it sounds, lowering the volume or pitch of your voice, um, being very matter of a fact. Um, if you've ever whispered, You'll see that kids often will emulate you whispering and you almost don't even realize it. Um, keeping a very matter of fact tone, regardless of the situation. Um, speaking in short sentences without a lot of questions. So as I mentioned, that front part of the brain is kind of turned off. That's what processes language. Uh, they're not really hearing you. Um, if you've ever been in a, a power struggle with a child uh, and maybe, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but kind of saying, um, if we don't get out the door in one minute, you're not having ice cream for dinner. And the response is, I don't want ice cream. They, they probably do want ice cream. Their rational part of their brain isn't necessarily working or processing that that language um, that is being said to them. Um, trying not to preach. Uh, this is about being with the child, not talking at the child. We can We'll talk about, um, you can always use this as a teaching moment later um, and kind of discuss what happened later. As Lisa mentioned in her story, um, the young boy was worried about, is he going to get in trouble for uh, actions that he engaged in when he was dysregulated? I, I, that was addressed later, but not in that moment of dysregulation. Um, and slow. So slowing yourself down um, will also help your heart rate go down. So that way you're not... Uh, as likely to be as elevated. Um, also, engaging slowly um, can help you uh, or help the opposite person not overreact. So another part of our brain um, when we're in this heightened state is very responsive to sensory stimuli. Like I said, to see that gazelle going past you. Uh, if you're moving quickly, 
the body's primed to react quickly. So kind of those slow motions can be helpful. Um, so this can be slowing down the rate of your speech as well and making sure you pause between sentences. You might notice even when some people are speaking, uh, anxiety can have the opposite effect. If you're nervous about public speaking, I was talking a lot faster the last slide and this reminder kind of helped me to slow down because that fight or flight response to public speaking makes you a little bit more elevated. Um, we talked about slowing down your body movement. Uh, and this one's a hard one. And I know this is one that I, I personally struggle with sometimes is slowing down your agenda and taking your time. Uh, you might not be on time to that appointment, but increasing the dysregulation is also not going to make you on time to that appointment. So slowing down and saying, I'm going to, we're, we're going to get through this, knowing you might be 10 minutes late to school, um, engaging that power struggle, you might be 20 minutes late if the dysregulation continues. So kind of just reminding yourself, you can work through this. Um, something I work with uh, at Sasco, we're a uh, training facility and I get a lot of students that are in their field work with me and week one that they're with me um, I always say any hard moment is a, a teaching moment um, and you can always use the data from maybe we didn't respond the way we wanted to but now I, I'm seeing a pattern of this power struggle always in the morning how can I change my routine in the morning to be more successful I can use this information a different time but for today, we're just gonna get through. Um, so if there's a, a difficulty in session, we get through. Let's see what worked, what didn't work, what was the trigger to use for next time to make different choices. So these are some basic strategies for stimulating that parasympathetic nervous system. So that rest and digest nervous system in the moment. Um, Lisa touched on one, but deep breathing, also called di called diaphragmic breathing, can be helpful. Um, we've all heard of it, and we probably have all tried it, and sometimes we're like, it doesn't quite work enough. Um, but it is something that we need to be really conscious of. The reason that we need to be conscious of that diaphragmic part is because that's actually where the, the vagus nerve goes through diaphragm, so it helps stimulate that. Um, versus a lot of times when we think we're breathing, especially kids, um, when we're upset, taking deep breaths, we take them from the chest, which uh, actually can do the opposite because it can feel constricting. Um, like if you've ever seen somebody that's struggling to breathe uh, because they don't have enough oxygen, their, their chest becomes um, overly inflated. So it does stimulate that response. So that diaphragmic belly breaths, um, but if you, you ever ask a kid to breathe, they'll always say, I am breathing, um, or often. So kind of making it games or just emulating that. So can we shush, um, the baby shh, who can do it longer, um, adding a small cognitive factor can sometimes be helpful. So it gives them something else to focus on. Um, sometimes I'll have kids blow out my candles that I'm working on. Um, but it gives them a visual or something to focus on. That's not just that auditory piece. Um, that we were talking about. Again, if all that you can do in the moment is just emulate it yourself, so that way you, uh, they can see that in you and slowly develop that, and that's okay as well. Proprioceptive input can be helpful. Um, proprioceptive uh, input is our body's sense um, to know where our body is in space. So it's in our muscles and joints. And it, when stimulated, it releases serotonin, which is that feel-good chemical in the brain. Um, your proprioceptive system is anything or is stimulated when you do anything, push, pull, lift, or hang. Um, the body often does this automatically. This is why some people grind their teeth at night or like to chew gum to relieve stress um, or like hugs. This is where um, you know, um, marketing weighted blankets can be helpful. Is any of one of these things the whole picture? No. And often kind of telling a child in that moment, let's you know, sit under our weighted blanket. And that isn't necessarily going to be helpful, but both ourselves engaging in potentially something that's proprioceptive. And if they were to then do something that's heavy work, or if they even ask for a hug, making that a long, deep hug. Um, sometimes I will, again, these small games that are enough of a redirect cognitively can 
sometimes be helpful if they're not complete flight or flight or coming down. I'll have kids, I'll put my hands out like this and have them try to push my hands together so they're engaging their muscles or put both hands on my head and pull down. Um, these strategies can be helpful for you in staying calm as well because it engages the proprioceptive system um, and can be helpful. Um, the next one, so a temperature shift can stimulate the vagus nerve. So this is where uh, cold showers or, um, or drinking a cold cup of water uh, can be a little bit of a shift to that system. And again, I talked about how the vagus nerve kind of goes from your brain all the way um, down and by your stomach. So that's that rest and digest. Um, cold water can help that shift. The last thing is thinking about the environment, but how can we limit stimulation in that moment? Um, sometimes this might mean having a plan for their, your other kids. Um, if you ask, they go up to their room. Uh, can I turn, uh, turning the TV off? or lowering the lights or turning down the music, turning down the external stimulation that's kind of keeping them revved up. Um, this, you know, at times it might mean leaving that overstimulating environment uh, as long as you can safely. Um, then we have to think about ourselves. There's that great saying that we, you have to put on your own oxygen mask first in order before you put on your anyone else's oxygen mask. I remember as a kid thinking that was a extremely weird, um, like, why wouldn't my mom want to save me on an airplane? But it's really so true. Um, so here is where we want to think about, are we in a place to self-regulate or to co-regulate? And um, I kind of call it taking your own temperature, but taking your own uh, threshold. Where am I at today? If you've had a really stressful day at work or uh, with the kids, um, maybe even a hard week, that you're probably going to have less of a threshold for uh, in order to cope with that, the co or to engage in co-regulation. This is where you might want to think of what's a good way to spend Friday nights. Uh, maybe it's family movie night or something more low key versus let's going let's go to Sky Zone um, if we know that like transitioning out of the house is always a challenge um, later in the evening. So kind of knowing what your own temperature is and what can you tolerate most. Um, and as I said, you always can take data. So if something didn't work last time, okay, what worked, what didn't work? How can we make that uh, successful next time um, by problem solving maybe a, a routine shift or what can we do differently? Um, but Things in the moment when things start to uh, escalate or a child's getting a little bit more upset, things to keep in uh, mind for ourselves or are we noticing uh, being more reactive? If we're more reactive, uh, our child's going to be more reactive. You can see things like a louder voice for yourself. A big one is leveraging consequences. So I mentioned that if we don't get out the door within a minute, we're not having ice cream for dessert, uh, oftentimes, we leverage consequences that can even be you know, more significant. Like I'm taking your iPad away for two weeks and you know you, they need to use their iPad. Otherwise you're not going to get your you know, 15 minutes of cooking time or whatnot. So now you have a consequence that you leverage that's hard to fulfill. Um, you can feel angry or resentment. Uh, common times for to, to recognize that it's harder to regulate, both for our kids and for ourselves. Um, there's the acronym, acronym HALT which is hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, you're more likely to be on edge. And our kids are more likely to be on edge. Um, and in the moment, we want to just be mindful that, that we might not be in the best place to co-regulate. And that's okay. Um, it's We're going to talk next about what can you do in those moments, uh, either to remind yourself of the strategies you have for yourself. Like I said, maybe changing your plans so that way, um, or modifying your plans so that way you're maybe less likely to encounter one of those trigger moments that are harder. Um, but that self-awareness is really important. So that next piece is um, how can we remember to self-regulate, especially when we start to see that those signs that we're not feeling good. I know for me, I always, uh, I, I can tell because I'm a little bit more reactive. Like I, I need to take space. I, I start reacting um, to my fiance that bit more, I need to take five minutes. Otherwise this isn't going to go in the direction that we want it to go. Um, 
I've kind of developed some of those cues for myself or that, that self checklist uh, that said uh, a common thing that uh, some parents I've worked with have found helpful are post-its, um, post-its that are different colors. Um, they might have a picture on it or a code word for yourself um, or a, a phrase, a mantra and putting them where some of the dysregulation tends to occur. So maybe by the door of getting out the, the car door in the morning or maybe on your dashboard something that's a reminder for you that when you're not able to think, it's thinking for you. Another common thing that parents um, have told me that's been helpful is using the notes section of their phone. So if things are really getting out of control, they, they might have the list of their few self-regulation strategies um, that they open and have read while there is a meltdown, maybe, you know, child's taking a minute in their room or slamming doors. Um, maybe you needed a minute and needed to go to the bathroom um, and just close the door and kind of remember what your strategies are in order to regulate. So that's a, a strategy to kind of take space as long as the child's safe. Um, also using a code word with you and the other another adult or another caregiver in the room. Um, that phrase could be, I need to use the bathroom, um, but it allows the communication of I need a minute. Can you come co-regulate for me? Um, and so that, that allows kind of the, the shift in who's handling the situation, um, which can be helpful. Um, one kind of last strategy I have is sometimes a pattern shift um, or a pattern disrupt is sometimes called in those moments um, using humor or a distraction, um, both for yourself and for the, the person you're with. Because if we're laughing, again, those mirror neurons are going off, you're, the child might begin to laugh, but it also sends those endorphins both for ourselves and for the children. So if you know, we happen to, um, in those moments, see the dog doing something funny and kind of pointing out that out, sometimes that, that pattern disrupt of we're engaging in this. Oh, there's something external that's funny. If you've ever kind of seen um, parents with a toddler, uh, maybe one parent's trying to get them to put on their clothes and they're having that, that temper tantrum and the other one comes along um, and says something funny or makes a funny face and then laughter starts and then they've moved through that that period of dysregulation. So that can be helpful when you have that, that partner that might be able to think more about what strategies can we be using. Um, Lisa, I know, always has a, has a great story about uh, co-regulation and remembering to uh, co-regulate and being gentle with yourself um, and learning through patterns or times that you might not have, so. Oh, I, yes, my, um, I guess my story about we all get it wrong sometimes. Um, so, because we do. Um, so, and I guess I'm just, I feel like giving permission to all of us as caregivers, as parents, um, that there are going to be times when we're going to totally screw this up. Um, and I, so as I mentioned, I worked in schools for a very long time and I um, worked with someone who was an assistant principal. And prior to being an assistant principal, he was a social worker, like a clinical social worker with years and years of experience, specifically working with kids who displayed behavioral dysregulation. So he was like, and continues to be like an expert in this area. Um, and in his role as an assistant principal, he sometimes had lunch duty. Um, and there was one particular day where it was lunch duty in a middle school cafeteria. So there were like, I don't know, 300 kids. Um, and it was sort of like a snowball of dysregulation. So I think there were kids out of their seats. There were kids yelling at each other. I think food was being thrown. Um, and in that moment, he um, did all of the things that you're not supposed to do. So he reacted, he got mad, he yelled. Um, and then at one point, um, and the way he described it was like, I felt like I had an out of body experience because I could hear myself saying things that you absolutely should not say. So he um, threw out consequences that there was no way that he could follow through on. So he threatened to assign seats to like 300 middle school students every day at lunch there's no way that you can follow up on that kind of a consequence. Um, and so, and he knew he was doing it. Like he, he had this full on moment of like, I can't believe that came out of my mouth. So I share that story just because we can have the best reminders. We can have the best systems in place. We can know about all of these things. Um, 
and still get it wrong sometimes and still have a moment that we're not proud of where we end up yelling or we end up um, reacting or we have, we throw out a consequence that's ridiculous. Um, and so as you are working through times of stress with your kids, it is okay to give yourself some grace and have some self-compassion um, because again, we all get it wrong sometimes. So moving on to slightly different topic, there are some myths around co-regulation that I have heard. Um, and one of them we've sort of touched upon, but so if I am in a situation with my child and they are very dysregulated and I am co-regulating with them, maybe I'm giving them a big hug to give them some of that deep pressure. Maybe we're breathing together. Maybe I'm rubbing their back. Um, does that mean that there are no consequences for what just happened? So, you know, maybe they're, you're in that situation because you have two younger kids and they were supposed to share something and that didn't work out and your five-year-old hit your three-year-old, right? Like that happens all the time. Um, does that mean that by co-regulating, by being uh, in the moment with them and helping them to calm down, that there are no consequences? No, that's not what that means. It just means that those consequences and those conversations about consequences aren't happening in that moment. Um, so again, to use the example that I think Deanna was talking about, um, I really like this. I think it's Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain. So if you think about, again, the thinking part of your brain is right behind your forehead. And if you're looking at my hand, it's kind of this, this front part. Um, and the feelings part of your brain is tucked underneath right here. So when you're dysregulated, you flip your lid and the, the logical, um, thinking part of your brain totally goes offline. This is true for adults. It's true for kids. So if you are in the moment and you are talking about consequences um, or taking things away or whatever is going to happen, your child is literally not hearing you because they are just responding to that feelings part. And there is no logical thinking. Yes, I understand that because I hit my sister, I'm going to lose tech time tonight. That's not happening for them in that moment. So Again, that's why we don't have conversations about consequences in that moment. Those those conversations should happen both before those stressful times. So being really clear and remember, this is sort of that um, environmental stru structuring the environment bucket of co-regulation. Having really clear, consistent consequences for what is going to happen should be talked about beforehand, and then having a conversation about okay, so you did hit your sister, and I know you were really really upset, and. I totally hear you that you were feeling really frustrated, but remember, here's the consequence for that. That conversation should happen when everybody is calm. Um, so again, co-regulating in the moment does not mean that there's not a consequence. It just means the, the conversations happening about those consequences are not happening when everybody is dysregulated and stressed. Another myth um, that sometimes we get is, am I reinforcing my child's behavior by redirecting? So Deanna used the example of using humor or pointing something out that's happening in the background that's funny or ridiculous to sort of just redirect that that stress, that dysregulation in the moment. Um, so, you know, the concern is if I do that, am I reinforcing that dysregulated behavior? And again, in that moment, you're... The thinking logical part of your kid's brain is totally offline. In that moment, you are just supporting what they need to calm them down. And again, you can have conversations again about expectations, about consequences, about sometimes even like, so if you are able to, um, you know, share with your sister without getting into a fight, then you do get tech time. Having conversations about reinforcing, um, positive behaviors, those conversations can still happen, just not in the moment. And in that moment, your goal really is just to get everybody back to baseline and just to calm down. Um, but so no, ultimately it's not, you're not reinforcing um, that behavior. You are just doing what you need to do in, in that stressful time um, to come back to a place where you can have conversations about what the expectations are and what you're going to be doing moving forward. Um, all right, so we are going to get into more um, of those proactive co-regulation strategies or co-regulation throughout the day. Um, and we have sort of targeted specific age groups, but 
Um, we also want to make sure that we're not talking all about adolescents if we have a lot of parents who have like preschoolers. So if you want to just pop into the chat box, how old are your kids? Um, and then we can, you know, sort of tailor our conversation a little bit more to whatever age grade, age range we have. Or if we have all sorts of age ranges, we can spend equal time on each. So we are sort of all over the place. So we've got everybody from like toddlers to young adults um, and some middle school aged kids thrown in for good measure. Um, all right, so we will, we will go through kind of stage by stage. Um, so starting with your toddler aged kids up into preschool aged kids, what are some things that you can do to encourage self-regulation when it's not that time when everybody is stressed out and dysregulated? Um, sensory experiences are great. Deanna is our sensory expert. So if I'm forgetting something, please jump in. Um, but as she sort of mentioned, there's, there's a lot of different types of input that um, you can provide that are regulating. Um, so vestibular input, so moving. So if you think, think about things like jumping or swinging, um, rocking, like things like that, that in, in all honesty, you can often find on a playground, right? Like if you think about playground, um, activities, there are things like swings, there are things like monkey bars, there are things, um, you wouldn't want your toddler on monkey bars, but you know, as kids get a little bit more into that preschool age, there are lots of experiences that you can have, um, sort of on your neighborhood playground, um, proprioceptive. So that, that deep pressure, that heavy work, um, things like climbing or crawling, um, those can also be really beneficial to kind of keep your, your child regulated, um, throughout the day. Um, things like, or things like hand squeezes, pushing against something. Um, those are also great ways to get that, that input. Um, there are also tactile, uh, things that you can do. So we, I mean, I don't, I'm not an OT, but I see a lot of shaving cream, um, in our space that is being used, um, painting, uh, like finger painting, um, things where kids are really touching things, again, can, believe it or not, be regulating and provide um, a regulating experience. Oral motor activities. So I think of like chewing things. So if you think of like crunchy foods or things that you can really kind of get your jaw into um, are also going to be providing that that input that is going to kind of help keep your your younger child regulated. Um, there are also things like auditory input. So um, music, making sure that you're sort of aware of the volume of things um, and, you know, whether something is like quiet music or um, help me out with this one, Dan, I always lose it on auditory. Uh, is it, like sometimes you know, drum music, you feel like you're like dancing or like slowing down. You use music as cues for transitions. Like uh, everyone knows if you if you hear certain music, you're like, oh, that's from the elevator. But you can also have um, well, the cleanup song is always for cleaning up. But we might have a song for getting out of the door, or that's just something cues. Oh, it's almost time, but it's not as forceful as like a a direction to kind of help keep us regulated by having that external piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then moving on to um, less sensory strategies, but other things that you can do. So modeling appropriate rules and expectations. So if you are, maybe you are trying to get out the door in the morning and just saying out loud. So remember our goal is everybody has to get dressed and everybody has to, um, get in the car and the way that we're going to do that is X, Y, Z. So sort of saying out loud what your, what your expectations are, what your rules are. Um, briefly delaying gratification. So things like, oh, we've got a friend. Hello. Um, so if you're waiting in line for something, like if you're waiting in line to get ice cream, for example, sort of modeling like, oof, we're going to have to wait for a little bit and that's totally okay. That might be frustrating. Um, and here's how we're going to do to get through that wait. So we can sing a song together or or we can do some deep breathing together, kind of training them or teaching them to 
not get what they want in the moment is, is sort of training that self self-regulation skill. At the same time, modeling appropriate coping tools. Um, so I use the example of feeling really mad when I get to a red light. You can say that out loud um, and sort of say like, oh, the light's red. I am, I'm feeling really mad. I'm going to count down from 10. And even a younger child can understand that and watch you do it. Um, and that will sort of help them um, with their own self-regulation when something happens for them that's frustrated. Um, I always love to hear like recordings um, of like there was someone who who recorded like their kids skiing and you could hear the parents' language in terms of how they were like uh, pumping themselves up because they were feeling nervous about going down a big hill. So the language that you use that you say out loud um, to sort of explain how you are keeping yourself calm, um, it gets in there. So you can feel free to model that as much as you you want or are able to, um, how you are calming yourself down, how you're keeping yourself calm will 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 help your child um, with their own self-regulation skills. Yeah, I, uh, I have a few kids that they'll model um, after sessions when I'll say it, oh, I need a break. Now they're, they're coming to sessions. Oh, I need a break. Um, you can also see the flip side being true of if you're they might they can model when they're more frustrated you know certain things that you're set you say and then you're like oh i did say that before didn't i um so you can see the modeling on both ends uh can really be um it is there and we want to see more of the proactive aspects so now i'm talking a little bit about um regulation th strategies through childhood um and again talking about uh the sensory regulation uh, sensory um Processing is a base level of processing in, in kids, um, in people. Um, it is the first stage of life, really, that sensory motor stage. Um, and it's the foundation which motor skills, which our development ultimately kind of branches off of, um, which is why it's so important for daily regulation. If you think about what helps you relax, a lot of times you will say, um, for adults, it's things like working out or Know, lying under the covers at night or getting a hug, taking a hot shower. They're all very sensory based experiences. So thinking about how can we give kids those experiences when they might not know what they need, um, especially proactively. Like I have uh, friends that if they don't get up in the morning and go for a run, don't talk to them the rest of the day. Um, so this is kind of like helping kids have access to what they need, uh, which can be through regular activities. So heavy work activities, um, we talked a little bit about push pulling, um, animal walks uh, between um, activities if they're in the playroom and it's time to transition to dinner. What animal are we gonna be today? You're gonna be a bear or you know a kangaroo. Um, it makes something fun and heavy work from point A to point B. Um, different types of housework uh, activities such as raking or shoveling snow. Um, carrying in the groceries or putting them away, kind of naturally add in some uh, heavy work, cleaning down the, the tables. Uh, they can also feel pride in the, the participating in um, an activity and doing it well. Um, some of the more um, cognitive strategies to support regulation proactively throughout the day is uh, anticipating triggers and being proactive. Uh, so preparing kids for transitions, counting five minutes down, one minute down, maybe using a visual timer instead of just an uh, auditory uh, reminder, uh, because understanding time can be hard for kids. Again, modeling and labeling all kinds of feelings. Um, I'm feeling like this. It looks like you're feeling like this. Um, we put a reference page a little bit about the zones of regulation, um, but teaching about the size of the problem and the size of the reaction. Again, not necessarily in the moment, but labeling things. Um, if you're in a traffic jam, like what size of the problem it is, uh, if somebody's honking really loud, um, then th they're having a reaction bigger than the size of the problem. And we're all kind of stuck there to, at the same time. If there is a problem, the reaction can be to be frustrated, not having an elevated reaction. So just labeling things as they come throughout the day. Again, problem solving solutions to problems allowed um, and with the, the your child. Um, again, using the traffic jam situation, you're trying to get to dance class. Uh, 
oh, there's there's traffic. Um, I'm going to, you know, reroute reroute route on the ways or um, on my GPS. So that way I'm problem solving, taking a different way. Um, it also could be, oh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call the dance studio and see if you can do a makeup class another day or something along those lines. So how are we problem solving together? Um, again, offering and modeling age appropriate uh, coping tools, uh, such as taking a break um, or taking a deep breath, um, modeling empathy, perspective taking and frustration. Again, going back to that, that traffic jam honking model or example, um, oh, that person must be really frustrated or having a hard day. So trying to show what perspective might be eliciting a different response. Um, again, using humor. Humor is always uh, a great uh, strategy proactively throughout the day. Um, people that are laugh, laugh are more likely to be happier. So um, and when you're happier, you're less likely to flip your lid as uh, Lisa said. So Also in childhood, we want to start building some independence. Um, sometimes trigger points are those times where you're putting more um, expectations uh, or you're saying, oh, uh, we got we got to get out of the house, kind of those, those stressed moments. Um, but helping kids feel successful, like they are um, becoming more independent and less reliant on you um, can be a motivator by itself. So sometimes adding in checklists um, that... You, this needs to be accomplished by a certain time in the morning. Um, and again, setting the environment. If you accomplish it, mom's not going to ask you or um, remind you of anything. If it's 10 minutes before it's time to leave uh, and parts of the checklist aren't completed, that's when she's going to be involved. So there's very clear expectations um, that can limit that power struggle and transitions or other times that are more challenging. All right. And then sort of for adolescents, it looks a little bit different, right? So adolescents are further along in their self-regulation journey. They've hopefully adopted a lot of self-regulation skills already. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't continue to need support. I think especially when you think about adolescents as just an increase in everything, right? Work, uh, school gets harder. They're social lives get more complicated. Um, you know, maybe they have like a romantic relationship now that you wouldn't have with a, with a child or certainly a toddler. Um, right. Like things just get more complicated and more grown up. Um, and so with that comes more stress typically. Um, so something that you can do is discuss and demonstrate strategies with your adolescent um, that include regulation opportunities. So we talked about like tactile opportunities when we think about little kids, um, but there are lots of things that even adults use that um, are in fact self-regulation strategies. So if you know anybody who clicks their pen, um, or if you know someone who twirls their pen, um, or like me, uh, is a hair toucher and twirler, those are actually regulation strategies that I think as adults we use, but don't even think about it as being a regulation strategy, right? So you can point that out to your adolescent. Um, I also, I used to work with someone, she was a special education teacher who always kept silly putty on her because for her making that like smooth um, sort of feeling with the silly putty or squeezing it during either really boring meetings, um, like staff meetings, or really stressful interactions was really helpful for her to maintain that regulation. So again, adults use these strategies all the time, but we don't necessarily identify them as self-regulation activities, but they are. Um, so you can point them out to your older kids. Um, things like sports. So even if it's not a varsity sport, it doesn't have to be super competitive, but when you think about some of the sensory experiences that we've already talked about, sports provides a lot of that. And if you think about certain sports like swimming or, or tennis, um, can often have like a meditative almost quality to them, right? Like if you're playing tennis, you can't really think about the thing that is stressing you out. All you're thinking about is hitting the ball um, and getting to the ball. And that can be very regulating. So sports can be really helpful. Meditation itself, there are a ton of good apps out there, um, in particular, like the Calm app. There's a UCLA mindfulness app um, that teenagers, adolescents can use themselves. Um, can also be really beneficial. Um, also 
pointing out to your older child um, the people that are available to them if they should need it. So that can include um, teachers. Maybe they have a school counselor that they really like. Maybe they have a therapist that they that they see that they trust. All of those people, maybe it's a coach, like maybe they are playing sports and they have a coach who they go to um, if they're having a tough time or need to talk about something. Just making them aware of all of the adults around them that are really there to support them if they need it. Um, giving adequate time and space, uh, you know, going back to the example of like your teenager just got home, you don't know what they're upset about, but they just slammed a door. Um, they are stomping up the stairs. They're going to their room. They are mad. Um, they might need time to just cool themselves down. That doesn't mean that they might not need a hug from you or words of encouragement from you at some point, but in that moment, they just might need a little bit of space and that's okay. Um, and then Sorry, <laughs> just continuing to demonstrate empathy um, and compassion towards yourself and towards others. So maybe maybe your teenager did, I don't know why I keep using this example, but slam that door in your face and they feel really bad about it. Like you can reflect with them and say like, you maybe not weren't proud of that moment, but you know what, it happens to all of us. We all get upset. Here are some other things like as a reminder that you can do when you, when you get upset. Now we're ready for the next slide. Um, Adolescents, teenagers are sort of, by definition, pushing against rules. They're establishing their independence. Um, they are, you know, getting closer to adulthood. That doesn't mean that they still don't need boundaries, expectations, and clear rules. Um, it just looks different, right? Um, but again, by providing those boundaries, maybe it's a curfew. Maybe it's um, a limit on who they can have in their car. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is in your house that works, um, reminding, kind of going back to that idea of those three buckets and structuring the environment to feel really safe. Even though teenagers and adolescents are going to push against those boundaries, they still need them. Um, incentivizing good choices. So maybe they have to earn time um, for... I don't know, having the family car or or um, having tech time, right? You can provide those um, for making good choices around, maybe it is getting out the door independently in the morning, right? Like maybe they're driving themselves to school and they need, they need to, to go and they need to be there on time. Um, maybe getting all their homework done and in a timely way, um, right? But you can incentivize making those good choices, again, with things like tech time or whatever works in your household. Um, delaying gratification. So maybe it's something that, they need to earn, but it's over a longer period of time, right? That really is training that self-regulation and needing to wait. So maybe it is they have to have a certain number of um, on-time days and then they get something bigger. Um, so that you're delaying that, that, that gratification. And again, that is training self-regulation. And then finally, we all love positive feedback, right? So um, it, it's going to look different uh, with your young child than with an older kid, but just pointing out like, hey, you know what, I really appreciate the fact that you are like coming home, getting your homework done. You've started babysitting younger kids and you're still managing all of that. Like that's awesome, right? Like just providing praise for whatever it is that they are doing right. And I think that is everything that we've got for you this morning. I know that we are a little bit over time, um, but I have a couple of minutes to hang out if anyone has any questions to ask in the chat. Um, and then if you think of it afterwards, you can always email us at hello at sescoriver.com. Like I said, there are a list of references up here that include a lot of where we got all of this information from. Um, and this whole thing was recorded and will be posted on our website, I believe. So um, if you want to look back at it, feel free, feel free to do so. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. <laughs>